The chimneys are white in the pale moonlight, and the trees have a silver glare. As the chimneys high see the vampires fly, and the harpies of upper air, who flutter and laugh and stare. For the village, dead to the world outspread, never shone in the sunset's gleam, but grew out of the sleep that the dead years keep, where rivers of madness stream down gulfs to a pit of dream. A chill wind blows through the rows of sheaths in meadows that shimmer pale, and come to twine where the shamrocks shine. Happy, happy Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Happy, happy Halloween, silver shamrock. And that concludes the final chapter of Death by Unspeakable Horror by Robert Block. Welcome to a special Halloween Purblind Gamer stream. I am your host, Purblind Gamer, who would have been cosplaying as the Grim Reaper, but I found it too hard to see through my mesh mask and read what was on the screen. Perhaps we'll figure out a way to deal with that next year. But in the meantime, <laughs> welcome. I have a spooky, spooky treat for you all today. And I hope you're having a wonderful All Hallows' Eve. As wonderful as it can be. Falling upon a Sunday meaning that the children's trick-or-treating must be cut short because they have school tomorrow, and the adults dressing like slutty mice and going to parties to get trashed must be cut short because they have work tomorrow. And even on All Saints' Day, it is frowned as when you drag into work with a hangover. Presumably. I shall test this theory, but perhaps not tomorrow. I hope you are all having a nice and spooky Halloween so far. I ended up going to a Halloween party a friend of mine was having after stream last night, which was a pretty good time. Hadn't uh, gone to any last year for what I presume are obvious reasons. <clears throat> and I would like to thank everybody who came to my final stream of Alone in the Dark on Wednesday. A lot of weird stuff. A lot of getting eaten by giant worms. And my Splatterhouse 3D Gold stream yesterday. Which was... A lot of fun, I think. Perhaps that is one of those arcade games that's more fun to play than to watch. But for a, f a fan game that old and a first-person shooter, no less, I was I enjoyed. I still enjoy it a lot, particularly as a fan of the Splatterhouse games. <clears throat> you all may remember I was threatening to stream things like Jade Wears Halloween or. The Mind Dark Oeuvre for Halloween. But the people have spoken. As threatened yesterday, I put a poll on Twitter asking whether people would rather I play a longer game or read an original horror story I've been writing and then play a shorter game. And the people, or at least the ones who voted, chose me reading a horror story. <laughs> and I've seen other streamers read horror stories on uh, stream occasionally, like last Halloween. Don't know if they do original ones. And we'll see how this goes, because it'll be hard, especially if I'm using text-to-speech, not be distracted and uh, 
silly inter uh, interacting with chat. And we'll see how it goes. And after that, we'll play Halloween House, which is a short but quite fun Halloween game that uh, won a Halloween game making competition back in 2007. And then we'll raid Artyom Havoc, who is uh, premiering his movie tonight. And we definitely want to support that. Even more so because he's not releasing VODs. Apparently we'll have to buy bootleg DVDs on eBay. Not the first time. I mean, what? I mean, let's keep it all legal. <clears throat> Purple on Gamer, LLC, keeps it all legal. And in fact, I own arcade machines for every ROM set I play. Yeah, they're in the basement. Hmm. <laughs> I should probably give everybody a little while to get in here, and then I'll start reading the story. <clears throat> what to do in the meantime? How about a nice Halloween song? <clears throat> I've had this song stuck in my head because I've been, I recently installed Half-Life on my computer from my Half-Life Platinum CD, and I'm going to intend to play it in the coming month if I can you know get some of the display issues working and then I want to play some mods namely the They Hunger trilogy one of the greatest horror mods for Half-Life could have been a retail game if you ask me but They, they Hunger has a fun uh, credit song on par with Seventh Guest and Killing Time called What I Eat and while we're waiting for everybody to trickle in here, I might as well sing that. <clears throat> I smell you around the corner, ripe and ready for eating. In the gutter you'll soon be bleeding. I am your only mourner. You are what I eat, so much flesh, so much meat. With my hands your skull I will beat, leave your body in the street. My arms are a huge facade, they rip your limbs from your body. Relish the pain wherein you writhe, you have met something rotting. You are what I eat, so much flesh, so much meat. With my hands your skull I will beat, leave your body in the street. Disembowel you with a knife, a smorgasbord of organs against the wall. No one here cares about your plight, we just ate your family at the mall. You are what I eat, so much flesh, so much meat. With my hand your skull I will beat, leave your body in the street. Yeah, you don't hear credit songs like that in video games much these days. Maybe you should. And hopefully we'll play They Hunger in the coming weeks and days and hours. And is it just me or does my damn camera keep shifting ever so slightly to the side? I should stick it in slice the spirit gum. <coughs> anyway, I'll go ahead and start this story, which is called <coughs> The Cat Who Walks Amongst Us, or closing night at the Lutzites Theatre, and I'll hope my voice, sir, doesn't give out, because if it does, that does not bode well for my voice acting and audiobook career. This is, uh, I could say I made it all up. I could say it's based on something unpleasant I experienced a couple of years ago. I'll leave it to you to decide. Hmm. Today's stream is brought to you by Dragon Energy Drinks. They've got taurine, they've got caffeine. 
they've got too much sugar, they've got dragons, and they're one dollar at the store right now. Hmm. I feel like that informs a great deal of my purchases. <clears throat> <clears throat> the Cat Who Walks Amongst Us, or Closing Night at the Lutzites Theatre. My entire life, I've gotten un on unusually well with animals. Ones I've never met before, even in the wild, seem to gravitate towards me, and even permit me to touch them or hold them, when, when they might not ordinarily do so. Perhaps they can sense I mean them no harm. It has been most pronounced with mammals, but extends to many phyla and classes. Dogs, of course. Ducks. Sheep. Reptiles and amphibians. Catching and releasing toads was a favorite pastime of my youth. I have even had an iguana-sized lizard, which avoid humans as a rule, Amble past me without a second thought, surprisingly close to the visitor center of Lure Caverns. When birds find their way inside, it usually falls to me to return them to the outdoors, having an easier time of it than others. I wonder, having heard my father talk about his own experiences with squirrels and chipmunks, whether I have a genetic predisposition to commune with animals. Of all the beasts, my bond with cats emerges as most pronounced. One of my early memories involves the long-tail cat and the short-tail cat, as we dubbed them, that my father and I would sometimes encounter on the way to the park. To list every cat that has rushed up to me, many of unknown name, would take a dozen pages. Molly the library cat, Bob, our family's Cornish Rex, Buddy Mullinier, the white Persian of Newcastle, good friends all. And while a few cats have regarded me with a glare and a hiss, such as the incorrigible old Maggie Nichols, these comprise a minority of one percent at most. Even now, when I return to visit campus and am walking back to the bus stop late at night, a plump striped cat will, often as not, dart down his driveway and demand pro proper adulation. These accounts may seem excessive, but I offer them with good reason. First, to demonstrate that I know cats well, and you may therefore believe me when I give you my oath that what I saw was a cat. This conviction I hold beyond dispute. I have another reason. Of all the nights it could have happened, it came when I was there. The... <clears throat> the closing night. I'll never know why. I should also warn you that my tale describes a cat in significant pain from the description, so if you find such a thing as repugnant as I do, you may wish to stop reading, because it was certainly a cat, whatever else it was. The Lutzite Theater is two years gone now, and if the name sounds familiar, you either had some involvement in the amateur theatrical circles of Los Angeles at that time and the years preceding, or, which is more likely, you read something of it in the papers. None of them told the whole story, instead offering half-truths and speculations, speculations continuing among some long after those papers were consigned to either microfiche or the recycling bin. None of them told the whole story because nobody but myself and maybe Grimaud knew the whole story. Until now, I never set it down in, in its entirety. Conwin might, if he's out there in his right mind. <laughs> but forgive me, I shouldn't write of that yet. The Lutzites, uh, the name and iteration that small space had gone by it was found, formed in 2000-something uh, by a group of young people, few of them long out of university. Their shows were almost universally comedic, generally original, 
and most often improvisational, in part or in whole. They also offered classes in improvisation, and the rudiments of acting, public speaking, and related subjects. Such theatres are, as of this writing, too often unsustainable in the long term. The sad truth those of my inclination lament or deny by turns. The Lutzites relied on the generosity of its patrons and the labor of volunteers to stave off closure, though it did well enough as such things go, and those behind it would uh, turn to funds earned at more traditional trades as needed. I was a friend of the theater, knowing most of the principal parties and many of the transient ones. So many friends whom I still miss, well, since the theater closed. I would attend shows or occasionally help in small capacities, even lending my writing talents. Uh, at the time I speak of, however, I was trying to suppress my theatrical tendencies and support myself with a serious career. If you looked in the program for that last show, you wouldn't even see my name. That Sunday evening I saw The Cat marked the closing performance of a casual riff on Lady Windermere's air conditioner, one of the more rehearsed shows to grace the Lutzites. I had seen the final dress and was at the theater primarily to help with the strike after the run ended. The house was near capacity, as small as it was. Prior to the show's start, I had helped Espinoza hand out the programs, and here it was, well into the show, and I was standing outside the stairs leading to the entrance. The Lutzites was in a small arts district for which a name could never be agreed upon, extending just a few blocks and home to over twenty small theaters or performance spaces. The negligible rent, more than the nature of the locale, attracted the artistic crowd. While not a dangerous part of the city, it was far from a desirable one, with sa a saddening number of homeless people and owing to its position between concentrations of watering holes, a fitful passage of rowdy drunkards. While it was likely the streets would be nearly deserted on a given night, there was just as much chance that it would see so much foot traffic that some might happen to drift to the theatre well after curtain. A large building housed the Lutzites, and other such venues, stretching half a block, a dozen steps, uh, stretching the length of the building, led to a sort of raised plateau of equal length. The Lutz Heights itself, however, was almost at street level. One had to turn and go down a set of stairs, almost a tunnel, to reach the door to the, theat to the theater lobby. Recalling the height of the ceiling in the theater proper, I cannot even guess what possessed someone to design it, or indeed the building, in such a way. The sign painted onto the wall above these steps, announcing the theater's name in gaudy colors and images, succeeded in attracting attention, not always the welcome sort. And the theater lobby, with only a thin door communicating to the theater, was such that any great noise in there could disturb the performance. <clears throat> It was poor Conwin's idea, stage manager for almost every show, after a few instances of drunks or panhandlers, or even voluble would-be theatre-goers, making inquiries, upsetting the performances upon wandering into the lobby, to station a man atop the steps leading down to the theatre, personnel shortages permitting, who could head off any invaders once the house lights dimmed, Explanations of the theatre and gentle admonitions not to enter could be carried out at a reasonable distance, where aural escalations would not disturb audience or performer. The other venues in the building either didn't bother or had no shows that night. You understand now the lay of the land and why I stood out in the nocturnal air alone. Cars rarely drove down that street and I had only seen a handful of pedestrians in the hour I had remained at my post. The autumn chill, 
sharper than usual for Southern California, kept people off the streets when they could help it, I suppose. I was busy cursing the facts that I had neglected to bring out a chair and a book for the night's vigil when a movement caught my eye down the street. Poor as my sight is, I couldn't tell anything about it other than that it was much too small for a person. A stray dog was my next guess, followed by a raccoon or even a skunk. The motion was so uneven yet unfaltering that only several moments of arduous progress brought it close enough to me that I could name it as a cat. A strained meow confirmed the species of the animal, almost a call for help. Before that, I had ascertained that the animal was not well. I watched its movements with unease, abhorring the thought that an animal might be hurt. It seemed to step forward with its forelegs, then pull its body behind it with only feeble use of its hind legs. My old flatmate Zed had a three-legged cat, Ophelia, and this feline's progress reminded me of hers. It was nowhere near as rapid or as regular. I wondered if its back had been hurt, and whether I should call an animal shelter. Ere it had drawn even with me, I got a proper look at its hind legs, or not a proper look. God, that came later. But a much better look. They were thin and red, the bottoms not recognizable as paws. I didn't gasp, as I might have done, because so sickened, but being so sickened, but only put a hand over my mouth. The cat could have seen my motion, but he turned slowly enough, with no quick twist of his head, that I don't believe that alerted him to my presence. Some feeling I can't describe gave off the impression, or maybe this is only in retrospect, that he was already attuned to my presence and merely waiting to turn until his path took him nearest me. That can't be right. The cat turned, seemed to look up at me, and began to drag itself up the steps from the street. Damaged as its hind legs were, I didn't think it could manage a single step, let alone all of them, and even less could I think that it should want to. I was tempted to go to help it, tempted to leave and call for help. With each stare, I felt sure it must give up and rest, or retreat back down. Still it continued, emitting another plaintive meow, even to the penultimate step, its head raised over the top. No question now that I was its destination, as its eyes met mine. I whispered some expression of sympathy, because I knew, in that moment, that the cat had been mortally wounded and was looking for somewhere to die. With no other sign of life in sight, it sought my companionship through what I felt sure must be agony and the nearness of expiration. Thoughts of comfort or help stepped back pace, replaced by a fear that there was only one thing I could do for the cat. Thoughts of the theater and the show had long fled. It was, after all, an, a cat, an ordinary wounded cat. It mounted the top step and, placing its paws against the metal post of an adjacent handrail, endeavored to sink its claws in and pull itself further up. Here I saw what had happened to its paws. I shouldn't put it that way. I do not know what happened to its paws. There was blood, but it was dry and smooth. It left no trail of blood, I should have said before. And as though the lower half of its hind legs ended in stumps that were nothing but bone with blood fused over them, even as my mind groped for an explanation, the cat pulled itself up, up with the rail, and balanced itself on those stumps. The cat stepped forward, upright, un unsteady on its legs, and uttered a mew of mild discomfort. The nerves must have been gone from its feet. It looked at me briefly, and then looked this way and that, giving a stronger meow as it staggered towards me. With every step, 
steps cats cannot take, I was sure it must fall. Yet it didn't, and if anything its advance was more regular than it had been. Slow still, it kept making for me, and I'm not ashamed to say it unsettled me greatly. The movement was so antithetical to nature, and what could I even do for the cat? The stairway down to the theater was at my back. I had the idea to retreat down the stairs. The cat couldn't make it, and if it only wanted a place to die, at least those dark steps might prove it a deterrent. My fear growing, for no exact reason I can tell, I needed to get away from it, and somewhere in my mind I must also have recalled that I was there to keep unwanted intrusions out of the theater. What else could have given me the idea that the cat wanted to get into the theater? Descending the stairs halfway, I turned around. The cat now stood near the top of the stairs and had every look of attempting to follow me upright. It couldn't, each step was higher than its legs themselves. Something kept me from going near the cat, and maybe that's why I'm in as good health as I am now. I proceeded the rest of the way to the door. If I were closed off from it, out of sight, it might cease to follow. My hand was on the doorknob, and I had heard no sound for several seconds. My back was turned. An, instant me an insistent meow spat from the sound of it for one step behind me. I flung open the door to the theater lobby and hurled myself through in fright. It was the work of a moment to close it swiftly and quietly, so ingrained is it not to disturb a show, behind me. Espinosa, the house manager, looked up with some surprise to see me enter, more so when she saw my hurry. She was seated behind her high counter, beside the door to the actual theater, working on some assignment for a prestigious acting course she was taking, as she had told me about it that evening, always learning more which she could bring to the Lutzites. The counter afforded her no view of the lower portion of the door I came through, "'What is it, David? Trouble outside?' she asked in a whisper. "'Of course. Last show of the run. Call animal control,' I hissed. "'There's a cat out there, wounded.' "'Out in the street? No, right there!' Espinosa joined me and looked through the window in the door. It afforded her a view of the stairs, with only a very small patch of ground right up against the door, out of sight.' I looked as well. The cat was not at the top of the stairs, nor climbing down. Espinosa gave me an odd look and turned the knob. I thrust my hand out and prevented her from opening it more than a crack, only enough to see that the cat had not tumbled down the stairs to lie huddled against the door. She shut it, and it wasn't opened again till I left. Seconds, if that, passed between the instant I opened the door to enter and the instant I shut it behind me. In my state, I was paying no attention to the ground, uh, to be sure that the cat did not dart in around my ankles and hide itself. It could have tumbled down the stairs with unnatural speed whilst my back was turned, but as I've described the extent of its apparent injuries, you can see that it was in no state to dart. To dart. Not even a healthy cat could have moved with such speed and silence, then hidden itself before Espinosa came around the counter. Our good house manager surely thought me unbalanced, since I did not offer all the particulars of what I had seen, but she duly took the lead in searching the little lobby to be sure a cat had not gotten in. The space had benches, chairs, low-potted plants, the counter, a cheap standing display. Places that you could conceive of a smallish creature hiding, but nowhere near enough with us making a search. There were no exits to that room save the two doors. Our attentions were a little directed towards the door to the theater, for, lamentably thin as it was, one could hear the change in the volume of the performer's speech, a constant sound, 
instantaneously where it opened, unless it were at a quiet part of the play. No, even then, and that farcical play never went quiet, almost. Besides, the door may be light, but its closing makes a sound that you cannot miss, unless someone eases it closed behind them with infinite care, something a cat and too few theater patrons well, uh, could manage. I did think, once, I heard a soft click, and was sure it was something trivial. I don't know now what I thought then, because that had to have been it, even if it couldn't have been. I was near the end of our search. I would swear that a cat remaining hidden in the lobby, undiscovered for more than a few seconds, could never occur. As I do, I must recall something that happened to me when I was perhaps seven. One of the next-door neighbors of my elderly grandmother had a problem with a couple of feral cats taking up residence in his yard. My father warned me about it before I went to play in their yard that day, as these were not the sort of cats it was advisable for me to try and make friends with. The yard was more of a garden with paths, bushes bordering the hole. I saw nor heard no sign of, cat, of any cats for a half hour's time, at the end of which I chanced to toss a rock into the bushes. I heard it roll, and just before it stopped a yowl resounded, followed by a dash of paws through the brush. Thank God I had not hit the cat hidden there, but I had certainly startled it. Not ten minutes later, in my idle play, I splashed water out of a bird bath on the opposite side of the yard. The drops that fell in the bushes were met with outraged feline execrations and a similar audible retreat. Not once, but twice, had the masterless cats been watching me, moving unheard and unseen, and juvenile chaos had brought about their discovery by the most infinitesimal chance. A theater lobby, whatever its trappings, is no leafy, well-kept garden. The situations could not differ more, and I do not mean to conflate them, only to acknowledge my awareness that cats can move and hide in a fashion man cannot conceive of. Espinosa, and eventually I, was satisfied we were alone in the lobby. The meow seeming close behind me could be attributed to a deceptive echo provided produced by the covered stairs. She called animal control, setting aside doubts that any cat existed, and I, never taking my eyes off the ground as I passed through the external door, returned to my station without to wait for them. And two, I assumed, to find what became of the poor cat. The street was again empty, until the animal people came. They departed soon enough, having received my much diluted description of what I had seen, and I strove not to wonder about what I had seen. No other excitement, surely, what happened before the show closed. <sighs> it was young Grimaud in the booth, that production. Manning both sound and lights. For the booth is cramped, and experienced volunteers in demand. But we did not. Sp we did speak later, and it was no more than minutes after I returned to the street that the disruption started. And hey, Dame Karen, welcome in. Thank you so much for the subscription. I, I really appreciate it. It's so kind of you. I hope you're having a good Halloween. Just reading this horror story about something that looked like a wounded cat that I saw outside a theater where I was volunteering, and which couldn't have gotten in. <laughs> it was no more than minutes after I returned to the street that the dis disruption started. The Lutzites was small, sometimes called a black box with pretensions, 
but the seeding put most cinemas to shame. It was almost akin to a cinema, with the small rows of plush seats. No center aisle, though. How well I still remember it. And its small proscenium stage, accessible by four steps on either side. There were forty-odd seats in the whole place, most full that night. The audience in the back row was shifting and murmuring, irrespective of the onstage capers, before Grimaud noticed anything, and it was by then spreading to the next row. Moving along it, along it back to the aisle, then another row down, as though some force waked the audience one by one. The actors soon sensed the change, but... They try to disregard it, and live only in the little world of their own creation. By the time it reached the center row, Grimaud could see it moving through them, the spectators pulling their legs away from it, watching it come, murmuring in alarm and wondering what should be done about it. It was moving faster than when I had seen it, staggering down the length of one row before turning the corner, or slipping under an end seat to do the same to the other. Grimaud thought it was a mischievous toddler that had slipped its doting parent and elected to cause as much trouble as possible. She got a better look at it when it turned the aisle to go down the third row. From the distance of the booth, looking into the dark house, she wondered why that very small child was wearing a costume, and why nobody grabbed it. Now Grimaud will tell you she can't be sure, or, what is more likely, will not discuss it at all. She was somehow distracted when the cat climbed the stairs to the stage, but she could not mistake it once it was in the light. Yet actors and set pieces obscured it, as its awkward gait propelled it rapidly through the scene, a quick loop bringing it into close contact with almost all of them. It shocked them, yes, but... They were actors. They tried to cover it up and position themselves so it went off stage as quick as possible. Even from the booth, they were obviously frightened, and despite what she might say now, I know what she told me that night. That was not a toddler in a costume wearing red shoes, even if she doesn't know what it was. He got to the stage right wing and staggered off, and there Grimaud caught a glimpse of my old friend Conwin, the stage manager, following the cat. Everyone there had clearly seen the cat. The actor and actress who entered from the right seconds later must have. Except for Fitzgerald, the ASM physician stage left. Fitzgerald saw the disturbance, but never the cause, only the briefest look at some motion leaving the stage opposite her. Then Conwin was waving at her, gesturing that he would take care of uh, some source of unquantifiable exasperation, and venturing back into the right wing. Espinosa heard some commotion in the theater, but when it died down she assumed it had been an excitable audience combined with the lively humor of the play, and besides, she had her mind on her class assignment. The actors and audience settled after it was gone, the performers alluding to it with little jokes and trying to deflect further attention, to return to the play. Conwin may have missed a cue, but it was assumed he had attended to the problem, and so everything was normal once more, until the coughing started. Espinosa had first dismissed, uh, anyone may take ill, uh, and suffer fits of coughing, unheralded in that season. I didn't hear most of it, only the very end, when the ambulances were arriving and I was rushing in to see if there was any way I could be of service. I wouldn't call it coughing, not at that point. It started, I am told, in the back, only a few at first, then spread like wildfire, following the same path the cat had taken. The actors, poor souls, knew something horrible was happening by the time it struck them. The coughing turned to choking, and worse things. And it progressed so fast. 
there was some effect on the skin as well, which I do not need to discuss, as that part is documented well enough in other accounts. There was nothing the doctors could do. No point in taking any of them to the hospital. Espinosa called before it reached its height. Not one made it into the ambulance anything more than moribund. We were, of course, quarantined, and the Lutzites became the subject of more tests than I can imagine. Every last member of the audience, every last actor, dead, in an unthinkably short time, to advanced radiation poisoning, or something very like it, everyone but myself, Espinosa, Grimaud, Fitzgerald, Conwin. A large degree of speculation, not so much among the general public, was expended on how Conwin got out. He did not pass behind the stage to the opposite wing, and he did not set foot on the stage. Stage right had, has, only one door, and that is the fire door, leading to a straight corridor with nothing but an alarmed fire door on the other end. The alarm never went off. So Conwin could not have left that way. Nor the cat. It couldn't have slipped back through the front, nor skittered past such a crowd, unseen, as the paramedics followed me in, had it even made it to the lobby. No. The aforesaid routes aside, one can only access the right wing via a thin ladder and an overhead catwalk. They barely used it not thinking it quite safe. Supposing that a cat, wounded or not, could, could go about on its hind legs and make it upstairs, it is above and, be it is beyond, above and beyond impossible that any cat could climb a ladder. Most who know about Kaufman, Conwin, excuse me, choose to think that he climbed the ladder made his way out of the building, and ran off, so afflicted by the horrors he had witnessed that he never desired to resurface under his own name. If one of the others accepts that the cat were there, they choose to think he picked it up and took it with him. He didn't go out another way. The alarm never rang as it would have where the door opened. I do not like to mention, do not like to think about the stage right wing. It wasn't empty. There was a sort of a mess. I never looked at it closely. <laughs> I'm not laughing. Nothing's funny, only I remember, as a boy, some Scandinavian's children's novel I read. A monster, the sea hound, was going to eat them, and a big friendly monster accidentally stepped right there, and they said then the sea hound wasn't there, only a sort of mash. A mash or a mess, and you don't try to put the words together in a way they make sense and you can see because you can't. Nobody explained that. There was no cat there. It had human DNA. That, what was there? I made damn sure they tested it. Not Conman's DNA, none of that. Or any person's DNA. It was so degraded, as if by radiation that they could only tell it had human DNA. No feline DNA anywhere. No blood that wasn't coughed up. No fur. No trace quantity. You didn't read that in the papers. You don't know where Conwin is, nor do I. Any more than I know where the cat is. Because I can't, and I don't. And if the cat's not there, then it's somewhere else now. 
far away from the closed-up Lutzite's theater. I had every known test given to me, and every specialist has pronounced me in good health. The other three, too. I must count myself grateful that whatever dangerous leak briefly blasted the rest didn't touch us. Such vague terms spoken in. I didn't type this to speak in vague terms, though the explanation is vague by necessity, since I can't explain that night. I have to stop now. What approached me was a cat. A certainty reinforced with every ordinary cat I see or make friends with now. I know that. What I don't know is why animals like me so much, or why so many friends and strangers died that night that I was left to guard the door. And that concludes The Cat Who Walks Amongst Us, or Closing Night at the Lutzites Theatre. Yeah. Appreciate you all coming in and listening to that. I didn't know if, uh, how smoothly it would go, or whether I'd get much of a turnout. Oh, thank you so much, Angela. Welcome in. I really appreciate it. Yeah. I must terribly, I'm out of practice writing short stories since, or prose in general, since... I guess most of my focus is in scripts, and I don't even write nearly enough of those these days. But how is your Halloween weekend going? And, yes, hopefully the description of the cat I saw wasn't too disturbing to anyone. It certainly didn't seem to be in pain. Oh, yes. I did, yes, I did write it. Um, it was something... I used to sometimes write Hallow short stories for Halloween, and so I tried it again this year. Whether or not that was the true story I'm telling you, I'll leave you to determine for yourself. And sure, I can repeat the last theater, uh, the last paragraph. I'm sorry, our stream was buffering. Don't worry. I didn't type this to speak in vague terms. Though the explanation is vague by necessity, since I can't explain that night. I have to stop now. What approached me was a cat, a certainty reinforced with every ordinary cat I see or make friends with. I know that. What I don't know is why animals like me so much, or why so many friends and strangers died. That night, I was left to guard the door. And that was the ending. Uh, sorry, I know. Buffering streams can be a damned pain. Mm. I always did enjoy writing short stories. I think I might get back to on occasion. Even if I don't know that there's much of a career in that. This isn't exactly the 1930s. I've been accused of writing as though I have pretensions of being the next M.R. James. Which I don't necessarily consider to be an insult. <laughs> mm. That's... A that's the first part of our stream, departure from what I normally do. And well, that didn't take too long. I thought that story might take longer. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that, Joey. Or Angela. That is my f favorite genre horror. I haven't done NaNoWriMo, Dame Karen. I did start to back in like 2010 or something. 
Didn't have a good plan for that novel, and it was a mess anyway. I keep thinking maybe I should, or the... There's also a playwriting version of it where you write a script in a month. But... No, if I'm going to, I also feel like if I'm going to commit that much to writing, I should try and do something that's more likely to be profitable or advance my career. Now I don't know. I may. I also have a half-finished young adult horror novel that I was writing a while back, and I keep thinking I need to go back and finish that. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm glad you did enjoy it. I might post it. I don't know where, so they don't have a streaming-based Facebook, and Twitter uh, doesn't take kindly to you posting ten-page stories, and who even knows about MySpace? Yeah, maybe I'll upload it somewhere as a document for people who missed the stream to read. <laughs> oh, right, NaNoWriMo starts today. That's I don't know if I should commit to write to doing that since there are other things I should be writing and they may be giving me more hours at work plus streaming. Hmm. At the same time, if I did that and it forced me to write, that could be good. And what is it, 50,000 words? I feel like that's not an insurmountable amount. I wonder how many words that story was. Uh. Okay, that was almost 5,000 words. That's not bad. Oh, thank, thank you, uh, Angela. Yeah, I will let you read it if I do finish it. It was... The thing I was writing, you know, in the, you know, pulp young adult style, like... Kind of the R.L. Stein and Point Horror and their imitators from the you know, late '80s through mid '90s, that sort of thing. That's a that's a good idea. Maybe I there is a way to email it, the subscribers or followers. I should look into that. It seems like there would be, since you know, sends out a notification to all the followers each time I go online, like an email. Fifty thousand words. I guess. The, Especially once you have a good plan, that's not too bad. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, either of you guys, or any of you guys, tried NaNoWriMo before? <laughs> I have too many unfinished projects, some of which I know I'll never go back to. <laughs> either because they weren't that good and I've moved on, or... There's other stuff I should be writing. <laughs> ahead and get ready to move on to the second half of our stream, which will be a Halloween game, which probably could have gone on Short Horror Saturday. Hmm. Oh, that's a shame that you missed it last year. Do you think you might try it this year? I mean, I don't know, maybe technically you're not supposed to plan things out ahead of time. I don't know if that's technically cheating. Oh, but you've done it in other years. Hey, good for you for doing it. Even if it's, yeah, even if it was only successful one year, that's a lot more than most people. I wonder how many NaNoWriMo novels, novels end up getting published. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean that it it is hard, and it does take a bit of practice, like writing, especially longer form stuff. Okay, ha Halloween House is not a game listed in Steam's database. What? They don't have thirteen-year-old freeware games listed in their database? Well, I never. So I'm officially playing retro now. Oh, okay, so they encourage you to plan. 
which is probably why this increases the amount of people who finish. Are you going to try winging it? Mm. Yeah, sometimes that can work, especially if you come up with a good idea and the basic outline in the first few days. Mm. That's what I tend to do. If nothing else, make a... Um, there, and change the category. If nothing else, just spend the first hour of much time making a plan, even if it cuts well into the writing time, and then go from that. That's just how my, my brain works. And wow, so The Martian, the movie, it was the author's first book. It was written for NaNoWriMo. Wow. That's pretty amazing. And then it became something so big. Yeah. I mean, it's always exciting to see somebody's first work do well. And show that they have talent. And then hopefully it's not the only thing they do. <laughs> All right. So Halloween House is sort of comic horror game. A short RPG made in... Multimedia Fusion or Games Factory or something like that for a game competition back at circa 2007. And now I can't find all the entries in the game competition because, you know, the site that put it on has gone down. But this uh, game was the number one winner, and so it's still available. And fun. I've played through it a couple of times. It's about... Well, I think the plot is fairly self-explanatory. Ah, so the book is good as well as the movie. And let's just restart this game. Yeah, it'll be zoomed in quite a bit because when it's not full screen, that window is tiny. It must be like 320 by 280 or whatever. Uh, yeah. Oh, that closed it. Hopefully it won't cause issues when I reopen it. Sometimes these games do. And I can't think why, because it's not like a full screen, so why would it change the resolution? Ah, good. Stream didn't crash. Thank you, OBS. Good old OBS. Sometimes. Mm hmm. Yeah, thanks for the tip. I. It would be fun to watch or to read the book and then watch the movie. This is the Martian, the one that people were saying was similar to Moon, which is a movie I also enjoyed a while back. That should be a little better volume level. What to think about NaNoWriMo? Also, I always seem to forget about it each year until it's almost upon us. <laughs> Maybe this is made in RPG Maker? Eh, I don't know what it's made in. <laughs> Michael, your dad and I will have to leave for a while. Something's come up. But Mom, it's Halloween. I know, honey. But you'll ha you have to watch Alice while we're gone. Be a good boy now. Bye, son. So it is significantly different from Moon. Moon was a good movie. Man, this sucks, having to stay home and babysit my sister on Halloween. Oh well. At least I get to eat lots of candy. Hmm, I like how this kid thinks. Wait a minute, where is all the candy? 
Did mom and dad forget to buy candy for Halloween? I'd better ask my sister about this. This bullshit will not stand. Mm. I see Moon's more psychological and... Oops. Martian is more... scientific. The horror of having no candy. What kind of parents are these? There should be laws, I tell you. Laws. A movie with some weirdo in a mask chasing a girl through the woods. Ooh. Nice. Friday the 13th. Or Friday the 13th, two. Three. Four. Not five, of course. Just kidding, I never watched that far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feels pumpkin man. <laughs> oh, that's a great Halloween emote. <laughs> I'll just start say I should start saying that. A green herb. Just kidding, it's actually just a plant. Oh, damn, I thought we were playing Resident Evil. <laughs> All right. Check on the little whelp. Blood? Oh, yeah, the A on the door. Alice? Alice! The little sister does not look so good. Well, what? Oh, hi, Michael. Are you alright? What happened? Nothing. I was just eating a peanut butter and jam sandwich and I fell asleep. You nearly scared me to death. I'm sorry. And there's jam all over the place. I used the whole jar. <laughs> that's that, that that's not healthy, Alice. That's <laughs> Mom and Dad should have taught you better than that. <sighs> anyway, do you know where Mom and Dad left the candy? No. You sure? Yes. Maybe they forgot to buy. That's not po just not possible. I'd better look. You stay here, okay, Alice? Okay, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it was an intentional prank. Yes, that kid. Right, when you have new candy, you stuff your face with jam. Or dragon energy drinks. Which I shouldn't have started this late, but I was exhausted. Mm. Yep. Tastes like a bargain bin beverage. Oh yeah, that rocking horse needs some oil. Or WD-40. Jam. Are you sure you haven't seen the candy? I don't have any candy! Whine about it, why don't you? A bunch of crayons in a drawing. I think it's a horse eating candy? Oh great, I bet it's Mr. Murder Horse from the Sandman. He's infiltrated Alice in his dreams. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have Dragon here. <laughs> Maybe our friend Dragon is secretly the an energy drink mogul. <laughs> Dolls. And if you see them in your dream, you better never, never scream. 
Hey, watch your step, you big meanie. Kid. If you don't want your blocks to be searched in an RPG game, don't build them into something that looks searchable. Alice, you've got a lot to learn. Must be imagining things. I don't know what he saw in the mirror. The skeleton, perhaps. Or, I don't know, an English queen who died. Just clothes in here. Something up there, but I can't reach it. since I've played this game. We'll see how much of it I remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's never stepped on a Lego. I mean, that's, that's the case for wooden blocks right there. Not as easy to step on or as painful as Legos. The downside to wooden blocks is sometimes evil toy makers shrink you down and stuff you into a dollhouse and make you rearrange them to create messages. Because, yeah, we're still working on the because. This is my room. I can save the game here with the computer. Excellent. Let's do so. Game saved. Oh, you only get one save game. Hey, Dragon Gem, welcome in. Oh, thank you so much for the subscription. I really appreciate it. So kind of you. How are you doing tonight? I was watching a little bit of a urine hairball, hairball stream earlier. You guys should check out Dragon Gem. She does a lot of puzzle and adventure games. Sometimes very hard ones. And what was it you were cosplaying as? I know you had, like, long blonde hair and a big dark hat. Hmm. Grim Dawn. Ooh, sounds like a prequel to Grim Fandango. Hmm. Maybe that was Grim Waltz. Speaking of dragons, I think we're on to you, Dragon Gem. We finally discovered that you're an energy drink mobile mogul. And I must say, a product is not bad for a dollar a can. <laughs> oh, wait, that was a costume. <laughs> oh. Storm makes her van... Basically, it's like a combination of Storm and Van Helsing. That sounds like a cool character. You guys should check out Hairball, too. He's a cool cat, and there's a lot of fun retro streams. I know you've been streaming strategy stuff. Oh, right, you were streaming Waxworks. That's another game I've been meaning to try. And also, it's weird. Hairball streams Bad Cat. I have a big box copy of Bad Cat. Hairball streams Waxworks. I have a big box cap copy of Waxworks. I can't shake the feeling that somebody's sneaking into my house, stealing the files from my big box games, and then resealing the shrink wrap. And you can play with the remote control cars. I remember it now, you have to break the window. <laughs> Maybe mom and dad won't notice. Since Elsa didn't notice. Then their kid is eating entire jars of jam. 
and that the candy's missing. <laughs> like a bad cat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I wouldn't put it past Fluff Bomb Cheer Glimmer to have had something. Maybe he's passing my, you know, renting out my big box games for other streamers. <laughs> and having a heat gun to reseal the shrink crap. Dashed clever. I've always thought there was a good scam in that, buying up decent big box games, resealing the shrink wrap. Again, new shrink wrap, and then selling them to unsuspecting people as factory sealed. Probably get caught eventually. Also, there are moral ramifications. Oh, oh. <laughs> the Bad Cat Network. Ironic, we were just telling a story about a cat that could be called a bad cat. You found Towel. Now let's see if we find Marion Crane. <laughs> Phew, it was only the cat. What is with cats today? <laughs> Even if there was candy in there, I wouldn't want it. Kid's picky. Loomis, our cat. Named after the doctor from Halloween, we assume. Something. Eat cat candy after that story? I think he was talking about candy in the toilet. But... No, I, I would be very careful about anything. Anything involving cats after that story. <laughs> Cat candy. Like gummy cats. There's not there's something there, but it's too dark to see. It's Jason Voorhees. He's going to kill us. We all knew this game was going to take a dark turn. <laughs> and there's the phone. Sorry, you got the wrong number. Fridge, candy in the oven? Yeah. I don't drink coffee. Mm -hmm. Ah, but do you drink candy? Mm -hmm. Locked door. That's hot. You found sword. I like this kid's parents' taste. Now if I put the sword back in there, will the table slide out of the way, revealing a subterranean ca uh, cavern where giant worms can try to kill me? Does anybody else have any plans for Halloween tonight? The sword, I believe, we can use to reach the key, maybe? Wait, how do we... Oh, hey, Fornado, welcome in! How are you doing tonight? Happy Halloween! If it is indeed Halloween where you are, you guys should check out Fornado. 
There's a whole bunch of retro games, including some of the 8-bit ones. Uh, well, I'll join you in uh, November soon enough. I'm doing all right, thanks. Had a pretty decent Halloween. And I don't know exactly what I'm going to do after stream. I did, did go to a Halloween get-together last night, but I don't know what's going down tonight. Alright. <laughs> this is why parents should have swords on their dining room walls. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. face appears. I don't have a treat. <laughs> you got tricked. Game over. Did I soft lock us? pieces of candy hidden in this game, but I'm trying to remember where they are. Another towel. I remember. I think I remember. found gum. It's a bit sticky from all that jam, but at least it was wrapped. This, this game teaches you things like clean up the floor and it may be beneficial to you. And don't eat entire jars of jam or you may give your brother a heart attack. All you five-year-olds playing this and watching my stream take note. And also don't watch my stream for another eight years. Twitch, you know. Ah. Thank you. Happy Halloween. You too, Ghostface. See you in a sequel. Likely. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. The man in the moon looked out of the moon and said, It's time for all five-year-olds to not watch Twitch and to go to bed. Or trick or treat, but frankly they make me a little bit young for that. Unlocked the door. My bicycle. I have to wait until spring to ride it. Or maybe I could use it to charge a battery. You should be so lucky. is full of junk. Is that just a pile of lumber? The washing machine, just some clothes in there. The box is sealed shut. I need something to cut the tape with. Just rip the tape, kiddo. I mean, I know you're young, but 
This is why we should have box cutters in every house. The most useful things you can purchase. Yes. Thank goodness we kicked a soccer ball through our window. Very useful. Another life lesson this game teaches us. There was just a piece of gum in the box. After all that trouble. I wonder why mom and dad put a single piece of gum in a sealed box. What do we have? A flashlight. No, not the swords. They already... Then I guess after we used the sword to knock down the key, we were like, I don't need this anymore. Hmm. Oh, good thing we found the gum. I thought there was another. Hey, Loomis, you want to get the door? Jeez. Cats acting like they can't open doors. Ghost face. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Do you like scary games? You must, because you're playing one right now. What's up? Oops, wrong movie. Hmm. was one of the quick click engines that this game was made in. Probably, probably MMF given the year. Mm -hmm. Wait, we got a flashlight. It's our old buddy Rick. Is someone there? It's just my hockey gear. Yep. I'm telling you guys, this is a secret prequel to Splatterhouse. Old clothes. Rather neat as addicts go. Thirteenth. Scary series. Guy in a hockey mask. One might say hockey masks are scary. <laughs> oh, the way he's leaning back. Yeah, because it is, he's kind of almost lying down, but more like looking up. As though the game's trying to be like... Show his face, but be like, no, this actually is top down, not partial or isometric or whatever. But yeah, then you meant that it is a pretty weird angle. <laughs> yeah, hockey without a mask. That sounds damn dangerous. <laughs> yeah, walking around like that. It's like that little rascal's gag where someone has to keep his neck like that for a day and so when he walks outside everybody follows him looking up trying to see what he's looking at anyway let's go interrogate our sister are you sure you haven't seen the candy
<laughs> just like the Sandman. <laughs> I'll give you the candy. Please don't hurt me. Calm down, Alice. It's just me. Michael? <laughs> now, where's the candy? I know you have it. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't effective. That was a bit mean, though, you know. Terrifying your little sister. I'm starting to think that uh, seven or eight year old boys aren't the most responsible people. Here, I'm sorry I took it. Yes, the candy! It's finally all mine! All mine! Do 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 One hour later. Michael, we're home. Ooh, a Michael Myers mask would have been even scarier. Oh, mommy, my stomach hurts. <laughs> Eating all that candy. And then there you have it. This game is basically a moral uh, fable. It teaches you. If you treat people badly, and then gorge yourself, you might get sick. Yes, justice will find you. Justice of digestion. <laughs> Thank you, Fornado. Hey, Splatterhouse. And Sweet Home. That NES game I gotta try the translation of in House by the Cemetery. I assume it was a movie, not a game. Oh, okay, Multimedia Fusion 2. Alright. At some point they just started calling it Fusion. I think that was like in the mid 2010s. It was a pretty short game, but a fun game. <laughs> Suitable for Halloween. Decent story. The puzzles were a little harder the first time I played, but they quickly came back to me. That's... That was all I had planned for tonight, unless somebody wants to redeem something from the channel points rewards. Oh, wait. Did I say... I was going to have game giveaways for Halloween. I lied. See you guys. Okay, okay, fine. We'll have game giveaways. <laughs> People often say to me, David, you gratuitous gargoyle. What about the people who don't trust you with their address? Or who don't want things, you know, sent that are very costly to send. And I say to them, what, you mean like steam codes? Is that what you want? Fine, I could root around. If I can't find you something cheapo. Hey, Dabracadaggers, welcome in. Ah, oh, yes. Something cheap, such as... Wait, is this horror? I don't know. Are 50-foot-tall monsters slaughtering people horror? Yeah, I think Kaiju Panic sounds like a good horror game. You guys know the drill. If you want to win this game, guess a number between 1 and 100, which is written on this slip of paper. And... Since it is my favorite holiday, and since, every, you know, since uh, I haven't had any, any game giveaway in a while, you might as well have a second game giveaway. <laughs> so...
What? Oh, did that, so thank you for clipping that hairball. <laughs> Thanks, that'll be fun. <laughs> I hope so too, Fornado. And the post office, they gave me a tracking number, but then said, oh, we can't track this package. And also, my post office here is kind of shady. So it may be that your Wing Commander prophecy is still in transit. I just need to follow up with them. But yeah, since I, I haven't given another game away, and it is Halloween, I might as well give away a good horror game. Something like, I don't know, Darkness Within in Pursuit of Loth Nolder. Which, which is actually a really good game. I played it a while. It's one of the generally considered one of the scarier horror adventure games of the, you know, circa 2010 or late 2000s. It is also one of the more squashed horror adventure games because certain idiot sellers don't know how to pack their retail small boxes. Oh well. So we'll also be doing this and. Yeah, you, everybody can get a guess for on this as well as Kaiju Panic. And if you haven't already guessed on the other one, uh, if you want to get on both at once, just let me know which ones your, is, which number is for. Yeah, I hope they do show up too. But, you know, while, we're, while everybody's waiting, we're waiting for everybody to get their guesses in. I know nobody's redeemed Song of the Day, but I might as well just sing it anyway. Because I'd been intending to do... I swear to God, that damn camera moves when I'm not looking. I'd been intending to do a bunch of Halloween or spooky songs. And this is, since this is Halloween, it seems like a good day to do one. Thank you. Oh, I think Abracadagger is, uh... Oh, yeah, you, you, as you guessed 53 for the first game. <laughs> so here's a... a rather forgotten, uh... scary song from a children's movie that I came up with. Like, when I was about six, uh... I went into Video Central, and they were going to... Like, we were going to rent movies, and they had a children's movie about a little girl and a kangaroo in Australia playing. And it looked, looked pretty fun to me, you know, because it was a cartoon and I was a kid, so of course it looked fun. And I didn't, I didn't remember much about it. I watched like 10 minutes of it, and the kangaroo was trying to help the little girl and had also lost her baby and introduced the kid to Council of Animals. And then a platypus or something was like, but she's human. And a koala was like, that's right, humans suck. We don't like humans. And the kangaroo's like, well, y'all can shut up because she's a kid and like, you take care of the young. Wheaton's Law. Except she probably didn't say that because I would estimate this movie to have been made in the 1980s and I don't think Wheaton's Law was a thing at the time. And then... They came to a rather scary song that was made an impression on me. When we tried to go back and rent the movie later, either somebody had stolen it or it had broken. But the... Yes, it was Dot. Dot meets the kangaroo. And the video store clerk said, No, oh, we don't have that anymore, but we have the sequel, Dot meets Santa Claus. Which is basically about the little girl rendezvousing with Santa Claus and saying, Well, that kangaroo just yeeted back into the wilderness and I never saw her again, but I might as well still help her find her kid. And Santa's like, well, I could use my extensive technology to search the entirety of Australia, but there's a good chance that a baby kangaroo is going to have crossed the ocean by now. Let's just travel the entire world ostensibly looking for it, as we have adventures full of extraneous musical numbers and stone lions coming to life and eating women alive before they get put behind bars. I'm not making this up. Children's movies get weird. But anyway, there was a musical number in the first one which I saw playing in the video store that made an impression on me. 
And I took the liberty of looking up on YouTube or some file sharing site years later, like, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And it was still a pretty good song. It's about the, uh, this, uh, legendary creature called the Bunyip, which is so terrifying it defies description and can, I think, can take on different forms in nature. <clears throat> now, within the movie, the kangaroo, yeah, if my five or six year old mind is correct, is remembering this correctly, the, the mother the kangaroo says, Oh, yes, we, we used to have some humans creating havoc around here, but uh, they're gone. Either brutally slaughtered or they ran away and didn't come back. You know, we're, we're leaving it open ended. This is a children's movie. <clears throat> but one day they were all. Uh, they were by the lake fi uh, fishing with spears, and they had little yappy dogs with them. When something ghostly and disturbing began to ascend from the lake and pursue the humans. Oh, the bun yips, very bad, and the bun yips, very bold. And they tell me that the bun yip is nigh a thousand years old. So you better head home quickly, and you better hide very soon, or the bun yip's going to kill you neath the bun yip moon. The bun yips partly animal, and the bun yips partly bird, and the bun yip makes the strangest sound that you have ever heard. So you better head home quickly, and you better hide very soon, or the bun yip's going to kill you neath the bun yip moon. The bun yips very nasty, and the bun yips very mean. It's the most unpleasant monster that you have ever seen. So you better head home quickly, and you better hide very soon, or the bun yips going to kill you neath the bun yip moon, neath the moon, neath the moon. And that was the bun yip moon, as heard in Dot and the Kangaroo. I think that's what it was called. And as remembered by me, having heard it a while ago, and having forgotten to rehearse it before this stream, ah well, you get the idea. I don't know how the bunyip moved surprisingly fast in that uh, movie. Rather eerie as these things go. Oh, we'll, give, we'll give people a couple more minutes to get their guests, guesses in for the game giveaways. Either kaiju panic or in darkness within, and then we'll go ahead and reveal the winners. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. It's always neat when those, uh, you know, children's movies have surprisingly creepy songs in them, even if they're just fun creepy. I can, I can see that song, you know, scaring some little kids. I, I was probably a slight, slightly hardier than most little kids, having cut my teeth on Disney's Scary Tales Volume 1 VHS and the Houndlight episode of DuckTales, which did cause the odd night terror back in its day, but... Uh, uh, we've moved on to other things causing night terrors. 
Dangerous Cats, for instance. <laughs> and it was fun to see the DuckTales reboot, where they had a glowing hound, and to be like, huh, this isn't scary at all. Oh, there's a game called Strayer that features bunyips? What little I know about it, the bunyip is a fascinating monster. And I did see, like, an ad online. They were making a horror movie about bunyip six years ago, maybe? I don't know, know that it actually got made or actually got released in America. Or whether it actually was good. Killer Clowns from Outer Space at five. That's... <laughs> Yes, I know. They're not as well known in, like, America and other region, regions, but... That's, uh... Yeah, I would assume they're pretty well known in Australia. <laughs> Ooh, is this the trailer from Killer Clowns from Outer Space? <laughs> it's, it's, it's... Sometimes surprisingly repugnant or startling sci-fi horror comedy. Doesn't a clown punch somebody's head clear off like that one uh, Friday the 13th movie? A bit much for five-year-olds. <laughs> That's... Oh, he's played Straya. And he hasn't found a bunyip yet. Oh, that's the bunyip song. Thanks. <laughs> should I? Should. I probably should just watch The Dot and the Kangaroo at this point, and many other movies from my childhood that I somehow missed. I've heard The Last Unicorn is quite good from about 30 different people, so they may be onto something. Really catchy and pretty eerie song. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. What are you going to do? Knock my block off? My dad and I saw Killer Clowns. He got it from Wallywood. Circa 2010? My dad doesn't normally like horror comedies, but he thought, he thought parts of that were pretty funny. Keep your shirt on. Don't worry, we intend to. Oh, from like the traditional lore. Gotta I should read more about bunyips and so many legendary monsters and cryptids. Wow. Brother showed you it when Oh, kill the clowns and that. <laughs> when you are six. Okay. So if nobody has any guesses, we'll go ahead and see who won the games. Do 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 Oh yeah, Waltzing Matilda. Actually my dad had that on a tape of songs for children he sung and he and his friends did. I remember asking him to explain it all to me. And it's like very definitely at the end it's like this ghost meant take me alive. So wait, did he kill himself and his ghost is singing? Yeah. And no wonder I like horror. <sighs> okay. If there are no further guesses, I know a lot of people have bots and things do their game giveaways automatically. I should probably look into that. And about 30 other things. Kaiju Panic is... 58... And yes, I believe with 53, Abracadaggers won that. So congratulations. And Darkness Within in Pursuit of Loth Nolder is, oh yeah, I gotta show it off so it's on the square, see, nothing shady, is 92 and a tree. Right. Committing suicide rather than face the legal system. And continuing to haunt the space as a ghost. And... Unless I'm mistaken... Africa Daggers, you were the only one who guessed on uh, Darkness Within, so it looks like you won both of them. Congratulations. Uh, yes, uh, 
send me your uh, address via Whisper, and I'll get those in the mail in the next few days, probably. Maybe tomorrow. I gotta go to work tomorrow anyway. Could mail it from there. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. Sometimes when there's not a lot of people guessing, people win a good number of games. That's a shame. Shame it. Waltzing with Tilda, Tilda didn't become the national anthem. It's a catchy song. Just like I kind of wish O'Donnell Abu had become Ireland's national anthem. Because I don't know what Ireland's, Ireland's national anthem is, but it's not better than O'Donnell Abu. Unless maybe it were a Mountain T or the Irish Rover. Yeah, that could be a good national anthem. So, that. Yes, I guess I should go ahead and start wrapping up and getting ready to raid. And I gotta figure out if I'm doing anything for Halloween tonight other than hanging out with my roommates. <laughs> oh, I didn't win his national anthem. That's a damn shame. But it lives on. Many singers have recorded it, folk singers and whatnot, at least in America. It's probably one of the most well-known traditional Australian songs, at least in the, in the United States. Better known than nightmare-inducing bunyip ballads, unfortunately. We must change that. Call up some of the leading folk uh, singers and be like, Hey, bunyips. And they'll be like, huh? What are you talking about? <laughs> ah, it's still the unofficial one. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's good. It seems like one most of the people know. Mm. The raid, for the raid tonight, I had planned this out. And I'd planned to start and then finish my stream earlier. But as you probably know, our good friend Artyom Havoc is debuting a movie that will be... Uh, that he made, and that he'll be deleting the VOD of and not releasing any copies of, so this is our only chance to see it. I think we'd better wander over there and take a gander at Artyom Havoc's filmmaking skills and Diablo skills. Wow. Oh, Pet Cemetery gave you those nightmares. <laughs> That's... And yeah, that did have some striking scenes. Oh shoot, did I stream so late and so long that we missed his film? Hold on, let me check the Twitch. I plan things out, and then I get behind schedule. I'm rewriting stories or something. Oh, well, blasted Heath. What? What? Son of a gun. Oh, sorry, I missed it. Ah, oh, well. Ah, oh, damn. I didn't realize how late it was, and I also thought it was going to go like the movie would be longer. Well, hopefully we'll get to see it. He'll broadcast it again someday. If we pester him enough. Or if, you know, somebody sells bootleg DVDs on eBay. Not saying they should, but also not saying it won't happen. Now, let's see. Who's online? Slardy, Seacross, Liv, Seraphines. Well, you know, we haven't actually raided TechLink, I think. TechLink! hasn't streamed in a good while and oh and he's streaming murder house which is i think by a vhs style ps1 style game by the same guys who did babysitter bloodbath which we played some months ago so we should raid our buddy TechLink. oh no you gotta go out and have fun <laughs> eggs and houses toss some toilet paper hey thanks for coming by abracadaggers it sounds like fun. I hope you have a good time and get lots of candy and 
outrun the police if need be. Or even if need not be, because, eh, it'll still be fun. I've seen video games built on the premise. So it must be fun. Video games are supposed to be fun. <laughs> right. I think Lloyd Kaufman said something akin to that when there were Chinese bootlegs of Poultry Guy Night of the Chicken Dead that came out before the official release. Now they wrangled that. <laughs> yeah. Or if your indie movie is just so old and obscure that you can't make it. Or you can't get it otherwise. <laughs> Two pillowcases. Well, that's a lot of candy. Good luck. Just don't eat it all in one night. We saw what happened to the unfortunate Michael. Yeah, that's a raid tech link. And he's, and he's playing Murder House. That's very suitable. I think that's I think that's the newest game by Puffet Combo, and it's on Steam. I was thinking of buying buying that one when it was on sale. Oh right, to give you guys an idea of what's coming up, huh? As we finished Prodigal and Alone in the Dark, we'll we'll be starting a new game on Wednesday. Won't necessarily be horror since Spooktober's over, alas and alack, but. I'd promised I would play one of the Carol Reed mysteries, of which there are about 18 now. So I think we'll start one of those. Probably either the first or the third one. And following that, I, I want to play Half-Life soon, which I haven't played in years. And I think I have working on my computer. Well, I have running on my computer now. It's just, can I get it working for streaming purposes? Then I also, a couple other things, I have this extremely rare adventure called Tears of Betrayal that was never re-released digitally that I want to play through. And it's been a while since we did a good rail shooter, so at some time soon I'll do one of those. Maybe that one uh, hard line. But yeah. Wednesday will probably be either Carol Reed or Half-Life. I like that hairball. Spooktober is a state of mind, not a time of year. And that was Spooktober in June. And there it is. Well, thank you again to everybody who came out for my little horror story and then Halloween House. And for the Halloween festivities in general. Excellent holiday. Doesn't come around near often enough. Um... Feel free to follow me on uh, Twitch, also on Twitter and MySpace. It was through a Twitter poll that we decided what we were going to do today. And yeah, there I'll also post about upcoming things. And I, yeah, and I'll bring back more of the channel point rewards and other things in the future. And whether, yeah, whether you guys chat or lurk, it just means a lot to me that you come by and hopefully have a good time and get scared by bunyips and cats and well little boys who eat too much candy <laughs> oh you're welcome hope you had a good halloween stream so say hi to tech link i'll see you guys soon and as the song says Happy, happy Halloween, 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 happy, happy Halloween, silver shamrock. Yes, yeah, shamrocks. <laughs>